All right, and I think we are ready to get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Aaron Schill. I'm the Director of Research and Programs at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and uh, we're excited to be uh, holding this webinar today hosted by New York State Library on asset mapping for digital inclusion. Uh, before we jump into the topic, um, I want to uh, first uh, say a big thank you to New York State Library for um, partnering and for hosting this webinar. Uh, and want to acknowledge uh, funding from IMLS uh, that um, made this possible. Uh, and I'll pause for a moment. Uh, and if I believe Lauren uh, is on the call, um, Lauren, if I don't know if you would like to uh, say a couple words of welcome um, mm -hmm. to to everyone. Sure. Hi, Aaron. Um, just want to thank you all. This is our final webinar in this really wonderful series. So um, it's been a delightful partnership. It's been so amazing to get to work with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and all of our partners across the state from libraries and other community based organizations. And I hope we've really kind of moved the needle in terms of our capacity for digital equity work. And we're so excited for this webinar today. So thank you to NDIA. Thank you to everyone who's joined this webinar and others. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so really excited to get into this. Uh, today we're going to be um, giving an overview of asset mapping and kind of an introduction to what asset mapping is and its value to digital inclusion in particular. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the tools that uh, we've created at NDIA to facilitate asset mapping um, by digital inclusion practitioners. And then we're going to give you a chance to do some hands-on work with those tools to get familiar with them, start thinking about asset mapping in the context of your communities and your work, uh, and talk with one another a little bit about um, kind of uh, how that might look and, and how you might go about that. Um, so before we do that, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, we'll ask everyone, uh, I wish we had time to do introductions, um, but there's a whole bunch of us on this call, and uh, so we can't do introductions. Um, uh, by voice, but I'll ask uh, if each of you could um, find uh, where you can rename yourself if you go to um, uh, the little three dots next to your name in the participant list, you can rename yourself and um, similar to what you see for the NDIA team, uh, we'll ask if you can, in addition to your name, put your organization and your preferred pronouns uh, in your um, in your name. Um, and feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat uh, if you want to uh, list your name and organization there as well. Uh, that way we can get a sense for uh, who all is on the call. Um, and I, I'm curious about who all we have. So uh, I'm going to launch a poll. I've got a couple of questions for you because uh, I want to see who all we've got on today's call. So this will tell us a little bit. Uh, so the first question, hopefully you can see, is uh, which region of New York are you in? Uh, I'm not a native New Yorker, so hopefully these regions make sense to everyone. Uh, if not, uh, pick the closest one to you. All right, I'm seeing a mix. Got a lot of folks in the capital region. Uh, pretty good mix, though. And if for those who are ahead, uh, if you're already to the second question, uh, I'm also we're also interested in hearing what's your level of familiarity with asset mapping coming into today's webinar. All right, in terms of where people are from, looks like uh, the city's got a, a slight lead, capital regions uh, pretty high, and then kind of a, a mix throughout the rest. Uh, and in terms of who's familiar, familiarity with asset mapping, sounds like a lot of folks are either sort of familiar with it um, or have heard it before, but uh, uh, could definitely stand to learn some more, which is great. That's exactly uh, what we're shooting for. All right, I think we've got uh, about all the answers in. Uh, so Hopefully you can uh, see the results now. Uh, you can kind of flip through and see uh, where are your fellow attendees coming from and uh, where do you kind of fall, where you fall in the mix of uh, who's worked with asset mapping and uh, who's new to it. All right, great. Well, let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, bear with me while I uh, pull up my screen share here.
Okay, you should be seeing a our intro slide. Can I get a, a thumbs up from someone on the NDIA team? All right, I see a thumbs up. And I almost forgot, uh, we've got a lot of people from NDIA on the call. Um, they're here to uh, be available as resources. So later in the call, we will be doing breakout sessions uh, and keep an eye out for, uh, there should be one or two um, NDIA folks in each of the breakout rooms. Um, they're there as resources. Uh, if you have questions, if you're running into issues using any of the, the tools um, or just have a general question, feel free to, um, to share that with uh, the NDIA folks in your breakout room and uh, they can either answer them or uh, help you troubleshoot. So um, thank you to all of my NDIA colleagues uh, for, for being here to support as well. Um, so, okay, we're gonna talk about, um, like I said, asset mapping for digital inclusion. Uh, here's a quick overview of what we want to cover. Like I said, uh, we'll we'll do an introduction to asset mapping for those folks uh, for which this is brand new. Um, we'll talk about some best practices, both um, best practices for digital inclusion, as well as some examples of uh, communities that have already done this and are kind of leading the way and have produced some really interesting and useful results. Um, we'll do an introduction to the NDIA asset mapping resources. Uh, so that you know where to find those and uh, what all support NDIA can provide uh, to your asset mapping work going forward. And then finally, we'll spend some time uh, in breakout groups doing a hands-on activity, which is basically just kind of getting started and, and gaining some experience uh, with those asset mapping resources. So an overview to start. So what is asset mapping? Um, you may have heard the term before. Uh, it is something that is required of states as part of the Digital Equity Act planning process. So you may hear it in the context of uh, working with or partnering with uh, with the state or other organizations that are working on uh, the state digital equity plan. Um, but uh, when we talk about asset mapping, we're talking about more than just a listing of organizations. It's more than just an inventory. Um, you may hear an the term asset inventory, that's really a product of an asset mapping process. Um, asset mapping, another product can be a literal map. It can be a map of assets. Um, but when we talk about asset mapping, um, what we're really talking about is a process. And it's an approach um, that comes out of the community development world uh, to understanding and addressing the needs of a given community and, and achieving desired outcomes. Um, asset mapping originated uh, in, like I said, the community development space and uh, was really uh, developed and refined by um, folks at DePaul University uh, and the asset mapping uh, or asset based community development institute. Uh, so I'm going to put a link to uh, to that institute in the chat here and uh, if I can find the chat and uh, that. Uh, that's a really great resource to find a little bit more background uh, to um, to explore other resources uh, if you want to kind of uh, if this overview and kind of introduction to asset mapping uh, piques your interest. I would strongly suggest taking a look at DePaul's resources and um, and exploring further kind of uh, the the theory and uh, some of the best practices around um, kind of asset mapping more broadly. Today's going to be focused on asset mapping for digital inclusion specifically. Um, so asset mapping focuses on um, opportunities. When we say opportunities and aspirations rather than problems to be fixed, what we mean by that is asset mapping is kind of inherently solution-based. Um, so it's looking at existing resources in a community. Um, it's listening to uh, what a community wants to achieve and then looking within that community for what resources can be brought to bear to achieve those outcomes. As opposed to kind of a traditional um, planning process or needs assessment process where we often go look at data. We might look at things like demographic data or from the census or other resources that say, you know, for example, there are this many unhoused people or um, the poverty rate is this high. That's really that kind of traditional approach is focused on problems that we then try to fix um, as opposed to talking to community members about what they want to see for their community and then what resources exist within the community uh, to achieve those outcomes. So some of the values of asset mapping, um, by basing uh, the our, our desired outcomes and also um, the ways to get there on resources that exist within a community, it really fosters buy-in and ownership um, within the community. And it leads to um, 
it leads to solutions that are developed from within the community. A lot of times uh, when we go about community development or um, other social service work, uh, even without intending it, uh, the approach can be somewhat kind of extraction based. Uh, so uh, often we at nonprofits or at government agencies walk into a community and ask, you know, um, have identified some problems and then uh, want to fix those problems for folks. Um, we're often asking people to provide a lot of information to invest their time and effort in something that may not truly be based in their community. Uh, and without intending, that can often be pretty extractive for the community. So um, by kind of flipping our approach and focusing on the assets in the community and uh, what folks in the community want to see, um, we're, we're able to kind of flip that narrative and, uh, and move away from that more extractive approach to uh, solving problems. It also can really generate a lot of interesting new partnerships and ideas. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, as we kind of get into some of the best practices, um, asset mapping is great at finding unlikely partners, unlikely resources that uh, those of us that do the work in, in uh, digital inclusion may never have thought of. It may never have occurred to us that there are certain assets in a, in a given community uh, that could be brought to bear to help solve problems. So it's it's really great for being creative and kind of thinking outside of the box uh, about how to address um, digital inclusion needs. And uh, in the digital inclusion space, uh, it also helps us better understand the overall ecosystem. So we can build a more sustainable and complete understanding of, of the ecosystem. Um, it can bring in folks that may be doing digital inclusion work, but then don't define their work as digital inclusion at all. At all. Or it may uh, help us identify trusted partners that are working with certain populations uh, that maybe not don't do any digital inclusion work now, but could be brought into the fold and could really help support uh, work going forward. So um, lots of values uh, to uh, to asset mapping. And uh, like I said, the, the, the ABCD Institute at DePaul uh, is a great place to kind of further explore and, and gain some better understanding of uh, kind of this theory and, and where it can go. Uh, so let's jump into some best practices for, for asset mapping, specifically for the digital inclusion space. Uh, and the first suggestion is start as early as possible. So whether you're part of a community that has a coalition, um, whether you're a single staff person at a library or at another a nonprofit organization that wants to get started on this, um, beginning early is, you can't begin early enough. It, it, it can really benefit a lot of the other strategies that may come down the road. Um, so if you are working on data collection, um, engaging in asset mapping, understanding uh, who is working in the space, who potentially could be working in the space, is a great way to identify where there might be data already collected that could help inform your strategies. Um, it in and of itself is a community engagement technique, um, but it also will help you identify and refine your other community engagement strategies. Um, it may help identify where are good meeting spaces, um, who are the trusted partners, uh, that can get people out uh, and that can uh, find out, understand what the what the real needs and and um, and best opportunities for solutions might be. Uh, and it's important to recognize that this is not like a one time undertaking. So you're not going to do an inventory, have a set list and then be done with asset mapping. Um, we really uh, view this as a process and we encourage uh, you to undertake this as an ongoing and kind of evolving strategy for uh, bringing in new partners, identifying potential strategies, uh, and continuing to evolve those uh, throughout the life of your, your digital inclusion work. So let's get a little more technical for a moment. Um, so we can kind of talk about the theory behind asset mapping and um, why it's beneficial and, and some strategies uh, that we'll get into for how to go about doing that and finding the right partners and finding good information. Um, but you also kind of need to, we encourage thinking about um, how to how to set up your, your system and your data collection uh, for asset mapping in a way that's going to generate the types of information and um, uh, allow you to leverage that information as best as possible. So uh, I would like to encourage these three questions. So think about how are you going to collect asset information? And by that, I mean, um, I could sit here at my desk and type out as many different assets in my community that I can think of. That's one way to collect information. It's not the best way. I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, that might look very different from crowdsourcing information um, or pulling together a steering committee or a task force to help pull information together. 
Um, so thinking about how that information will be collected is important. Thinking about how it will be managed and analyzed. So will it live in one central location where just a few people are able to edit and add stuff? Uh, is it something that can be edited and added to by lots of different community members from lots of different organizations? And, and what does the access need to look like in order to do that? And then thinking about what are the outputs? So how will you share this information or how will you present it going forward? Um, so do you want to create a public facing resource? Um, is it something that you're going to be going back to pretty regularly uh, and um, sharing information um, uh, with, with other folks that may be part of your coalition or other partners that need to leverage this information a lot? So thinking about those at the beginning can be really valuable and, and frankly, from my own experience, save you a lot of rework. Um, you know, I uh, when I first did asset mapping, like a lot of folks, uh, we didn't call it that. Uh, I was getting started in digital inclusion work and I was like, I don't know who else is doing this. So I'm just going to start a spreadsheet and start putting some stuff in as I talk to people. Um, not giving any thought to like how we might want to leverage that in the future or what might happen um, with that data going forward. Uh, and so I found myself kind of recreating and reworking this. Um, whereas if I had kind of thought about this a little more systematically from the beginning, uh, probably could have collected that data in a way that um, that was a little more efficient, was more usable. Um, so a couple uh, specific things to think about. Um, you know, often this data is collected in a centralized spreadsheet or a database. Um, so thinking about um, does that database need to be accessible by, like I said before, people from a lot of different organizations? So it should it be cloud-based? Um, do you need to have certain access controls or editing controls? Um, would you want to link it to your CRM? So if this is maybe a tool that you would use to build your coalition, are you sending out regular communications to a group of people that might be part of that asset mapping? Um, and so capturing and linking contact information to um, an email system or other CRM tools could be really valuable. Um, you'll see in a moment um, a few examples of uh, online maps that allow you to locate um, where digital inclusion resources are available in your community. Um, so collecting information in a way that could be linked to a GIS system could be really useful. Um, or some other data visualization. So do you want to kind of get a sense for um, some reporting for who's doing work in what different areas of digital inclusion or certain populations that might be served? Um, and so do you want to link it to a visualization software like Tableau or something else? Um, so thinking about all those things uh, early could be really useful. And then the last one on um, this online forms and surveys, uh, which you'll see an example uh, that we've created. Um, that can be a great way to collect information from a lot of different folks. So, um, you know, we can try to jot down as many um, examples of assets uh, for an inventory as possible, but being able to put out a survey to a lot of people or embed a survey in your website where organizations can input their own information or input information about other assets in the community they're aware of, um, that can be a really great way to, um, to collect information quickly, gather a lot of information, um, in kind of a, a distributed way. So um, thinking about how to format that um, and collect that information uh, in a form or survey can be really valuable. Um, so just a, those are kind of a few of the technical considerations that we really encourage uh, thinking about early and often. Uh, so let's move on to, uh, so you've kind of thought through that and now we're ready to actually start, start collecting information. Um, so let's move on to some of the best practices for doing uh, doing the work of asset mapping. The first thing we suggest is kind of taking this concentric rings approach. Uh, and you'll see this graphic. Um, this will come up uh, a number of times kind of in our conversation. You'll see it in some different places. Um, but this is, a, this is a really valuable way of kind of organizing your work and thinking about um, where do I get the most bang for my buck and where should I get started? Uh, so we suggest starting with that middle circle, um, digital equity organizations. So these are organizations that core to their mission is digital inclusion work. Um, so these You'll see a couple of examples. You know, NDIA is an example of one of those uh, nonprofit device refurbishers that either may be in your community or service your community. Um, if you have a digital inclusion coalition in your community, um, these are the organizations that uh, show up to work every day thinking about digital inclusion as their top priority. Not only are they probably the most obvious uh, assets in your community uh, in this space, um, and so you they would kind of be the low hanging fruit you might think of. Um, but they also have a lot of other connections. So they can be really valuable partners to bring into the asset mapping process early because they can also connect you to a lot of other assets uh, that they're working with. Um, that second tier is where a lot of your organizations, um, public libraries, 
fall, which is organizations that run digital inclusion programs, but maybe have like a broader mission or, or digital inclusion is not the central focus of their mission. Um, this is where I think a lot of the, the digital inclusion practitioners actually fall. Um, there actually aren't a ton of digital inclusion specific organizations, but there are a lot of organizations and communities that have some programs that they're running um, that are doing digital inclusion work every day. Uh, that serve broader um, swaths of the community. So public libraries, senior centers, community centers. Um, I'm sure you, you're already starting to think of different uh, organizations that fall into this tier. Uh, so you'll, I, I like to say, this is kind of where you'll get the meat of your, um, of, of the organizations and uh, the information in your asset mapping is, is these kind of um, organizations that run digital inclusion programs. Um, the next is organizations that serve covered populations. We use the term covered populations. You, may have heard that before. If you haven't heard that before, that's a specific term from the Digital Equity Act. Um, and it's how states and uh, the federal government are thinking about um, populations with um, unique and higher digital inclusion needs. Um, so we use that term just to kind of align with, um, with those federal and state programs. Um, but covered populations are a lot of the folks that you might think of. Um, so older adults, um, uh, non-white populations, uh, folks in um, lower income communities. Uh, you can see a few other examples um, in the on the slide here. Uh, so these may be organizations that don't actually do digital inclusion work themselves, but are trusted organizations that are regularly interacting with the folks that are in need of digital equity services. Uh, and so um, they can be really great partners in this work. Um, they may be doing some digital inclusion work already and don't think of it that way. Um, I think of, uh, for example, like social service programs. So if you're a caseworker, um, and you need to help your um, clients sign up for benefits, um, get access to uh, food stamps or cash support or something else. A lot of times you're doing digital inclusion work just because you need to um, create an email address or get internet access to be able to access those online um, resources. And so a lot of folks are doing this, but they just don't call it digital inclusion work. Um, otherwise, other times they may not be doing the work, but, but they're your way into um, accessing and supporting some of these different communities. Uh, and then the last one, which I think is the most interesting, is these other community assets. So this is kind of the catch-all for other groups um, that could be really valuable resources in digital inclusion, but probably don't think about this every day. Um, maybe you're tangentially collect, connected to the work, um, but this could be a really broad group. So I've listed a few there. Um, anchor institutions, ISPs can be great partners, um, uh, policymakers, but then things like community gathering spaces. Um, shared culture or shared um, norms can be a really important asset to leverage. The example I give here back in my city planning days, I was working in a neighborhood in um, Columbus, Ohio, uh, doing a community plan. And we learned pretty early on that the, uh, the head of the Civic Association, a woman named Joyce Hughes, um, she lived, had lived in the neighborhood her whole life. Um, she was the trusted person. Uh, we were not going to have any success in that community um, until uh, we had met with and talked with and, and were trusted by Joyce. Uh, and we learned that early on, and we learned that one of the biggest assets in that community was Joyce's front porch. Um, that's where people got together. Like, that's where you found out what's happening in the neighborhood. That's where um, the tea got spilled. That's where uh, people would get together and talk about um, pretty important things happening in the community. Um, and so we implemented what we called porch chats, which was just like informal conversations on Joyce's porch, where we could talk about some of the planning issues and needs. So in that instance, um, those porch chats and Joyce's porch were one of the most important assets in our in our work. Um, so I would really encourage you to be creative um, and think about, you know, in in each community, there are these different assets. Some of them may be obvious. Some of them may, them may not be obvious, but um, will be potentially some of your, your most valuable assets. All right, so moving on to some other approaches. So taking a layered approach, uh, this can be a really big undertaking. Um, it, it's tough for any, uh, certainly any one person, but even tough for any one organization to undertake. Uh, so um, when, we're, when we're talking about this work, we talk about it as um, kind of a process, like I said before, but also um, we encourage you to think about um, who is best suited to collect different types of information. Um, so there are going to be certain um, assets and certain uh, resources in the community that local governments or regional governments, so maybe a planning commissioner or, or someone, um, will be most familiar with and best suited to collect. 
Um, you may have existing coalitions in your community, even if it's not a digital inclusion coalition, there might be other types of associations, um, uh, community development associations or, or others uh, that um, would be really helpful partners in um, collecting information. Anchor institutions are a great resource. Uh, if you think about your community foundation and all of the grants, the grantees that they work with on a regular basis, um, and then leveraging your state uh, digital equity or broadband office. Um, like I mentioned at the top of the uh, of the hour, um, they're required to do this anyway. They're, your state is working on uh, an asset inventory for your state digital equity plan right now. Um, and so they can be a really key uh, resource for this. You can also be a really valuable resource to them in providing this local asset information up to uh, up to that process and ensuring that um, the important assets in your community are reflected in the state asset inventory. Uh, and then also think about um, what level of detail is necessary for different types of assets. You'll see the resources that we've cr created are pretty comprehensive. There are a lot of fields. I'll say that again later. Um, but that doesn't mean you need to collect everything for everyone. Um, you don't need to collect all the all the same information. So if, um, for example, um, you know, you're working with a senior center and the way that they're going to be engaged is uh, they're going to provide you a space to meet with seniors, but maybe they're not doing any digital inclusion program, pro programming themselves. Uh, you can probably skip a lot of the details about, you know, services offered and, um, and the resources that they provide because they maybe don't do that. And so maybe you just need some basic information about one organization, whereas like a device refurbisher, you might want to get really specific about the types of devices, the costs of devices, uh, eligibility criteria, that kind of stuff. So you'll see that in the templates that we've created, um, that varying levels of detail is totally appropriate and uh, probably the way to go in most cases. Standardizing data can be really important, um, you know, especially if you have a lot of people contributing to this. Um, one of the keys that, uh, that we have thought about at NDIA when we created resources, we want to create common language and try to help standardize data um, across asset mapping efforts, um, not only in your community, but if you're talking to your neighbor, um, you don't want an entirely different set of fields or entirely different language that doesn't talk to each other. So um, we really promote um, trying to standardize data uh, so that it can be aggregated. Uh, we've provided some guidance. Uh, our templates um, provide some standard fields and standard um, values for filling in those fields. We really encourage folks to use those, um, but whether you use our resources or not, um, setting some standardization criteria uh, and um, and making sure that that's consistent can be really valuable down the road uh, as you're trying to pull different asset information together. All right, so let's look at a couple examples just very briefly. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna uh, just very quickly highlight these. Uh, the state of Hawaii, um, uh, undertook an asset mapping process uh, a couple of years ago at this point. And uh, I love this example of an output because um, it shows some creative ways that you can use that information. So what they wanted to do was understand their digital equity ecosystem. And uh, if only we could all live in Hawaii and our uh, ecosystem looked as beautiful as this. Um, so aside from the um, beautiful picture and wishing that uh, I was at the beach right now, what's really valuable about this is um, they uh, created this very accessible way to understand the digital equity ecosystem where they related different components of the ecosystem to um, different components of the natural ecosystem uh, in their state. Um, obviously, mine in Oregon, yours in New York, um, ours in different parts of the country would look very different. But I think this is a really great way to illustrate um, how you can leverage asset information to better understand um, the digital equity ecosystem and communicate that uh, to the public, to potential partners, and, and think about your work going forward. Um, another, like, uh, maybe, I don't want to call it more practical, but uh, a different approach, uh, the city of Seattle and King County um, developed an asset inventory uh, and a uh, resource directory um, from their asset mapping efforts. And so uh, it's a little small on the screen, but uh, there's a map that you can see that's an interactive map where you can go click on different resources. So you can see what resources are close to me um, wherever I live. Uh, and um, it is searchable by um, by specific city in the Seattle region, um, by types of resources or types of services offered, um, which ones provide devices. So it's a filterable list um, that uh, either you um, or a community member could use 
to um, find the very specific resources that uh, that folks need. All right, uh, and we're going to move on now to, um, and I see a, a question in the chat. Can we drop links for both of those? Uh, yes, we will drop links. Um, I'm going to show you in just a moment where you can find those. Uh, so great segue. Uh, and we will also make, uh, we can make the slides available. So the place that I would suggest going to find um, both those best practices and some others are NDIA's asset mapping webpage. Uh, we launched this in the fall, and uh, this is kind of your one-stop shop for all of our asset mapping resources. I'm going to uh, drop a link here in the chat. Uh, bear with me just a moment. So there's a link to NDIA's asset mapping resources. And what you'll find on this page is an overview, so a very, very short version of a couple of the key points that I've, I've mentioned today, a link to the asset uh, Based Community Development Institute at DePaul is on there. Um, some recommended strategies. So some of those that concentric rings approach, for example, is on this page. Um, there are also downloadable templates, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, there are some additional best practices. So the couple that I just showed you, uh, along with a few more, and we're going to continue adding to that as more and more communities undertake asset mapping. Uh, coming soon, we've got some video tutorials that will walk you through how to use our tools. And um, maybe most importantly is um, this is a place that you can contribute also. So reach back out to us. We want This is a growing community of practice around asset mapping. So we want to hear what you're doing, your innovative approaches and solutions. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, and uh, hopefully all of you received an email from me yesterday evening um, with links to these resources. Uh, we're going to talk about NDIA's um, asset mapping uh, inventory template, as well as our survey template. Um, these are tools to facilitate uh, asset mapping processes, so facilitate the data collection process. Um, they're essentially two formats of the exact same information. So uh, we will talk about the inventory template, which is kind of the spreadsheet version. Um, but just know that uh, the survey template takes all of those same fields and puts them in an easily accessible survey format uh, that would allow you to send out a link. Um, or to uh, embed that in a website. So again, if you want to crowdsource information, that survey is set to go, uh, and you can you can use that. It'll come in in the same format that would allow you to join it up with any other data in um, the spreadsheet uh, inventory template. So they're designed to work hand in hand and um, to again standardize that data collection uh, in a way that's e easily accessible. Um, you can find links to both of those templates um, on our webpage. Uh, so the template is uh, designed to be flexible. So it can collect uh, lots of different asset information, um, information about a lot of different types of assets. Uh, I mentioned before, it contains lots and lots of fields. Um, but just know that you should only gather what you need for a given asset. And uh, each row can be sp is specific to one asset. Um, a row could be an organization or a row could be a specific program that an organization runs. So maybe your library provides a digital navigator program. Maybe you also have a device lending program, and maybe you have um, an ACP, you know, or um, other program that helps people access free or low cost internet. Um, so each of those programs could be their own row, and your organization might be listed multiple times because you want to capture information about each program. That's totally fine. If you just want to get an idea of like who does digital equity or who serves a certain population, maybe you just list an organization and some key contact information. That's also fine. Um, these are designed to meet your needs and be as flexible as you need. I will say if you, uh, you'll see the bullet point there um, or the, the little star there, if you make certain changes, um, there's some functionality built in uh, to allow you to select multiple values. Um, and the, the web page provides a little bit more detail, but if you change, uh, make significant changes to the templates, some of that functionality might go away, but at a minimum, all the, the standard fields, all the um, standard response options um, will be there. So using these templates, which uh, we're gonna, in just a moment, um, jump over to breakout rooms and give you a chance to kind of get your hands on these tools and, and start thinking about this and doing some data collection uh, or input yourselves. Um, so just a little bit of wayfinding in the inventory tool. Again, hopefully everybody has um, been able to access that and save their own local version. Um, if not, you can go to the webpage and do that now. 
Uh, so you'll notice there are two tabs at the bottom of the spreadsheet. There's a data dictionary tab, which is the second tab, and that provides a listing of all the fields. It um, provides a description of uh, the grouping. So we've grouped fields into categories. So it provides a description of that. Uh, and it's just a kind of a way to understand what all's in the, in the inventory. Uh, and then you'll see that um, each field uh, is one of three different types of data. So uh, there's a free text field like email address where you just type in an email address. Um, there's a single value field where you can only pick one option. So for example, state or territory, you can only pick one option. And then there's multi uh, value fields, um, which have a white background and colored text. That's the way that we note those um, in the inventory. And those allow you to pick multiple options. So for example, days of operation, if you're gonna create a directory for people, it might be really important for them to know what days a resource is open. And so you can select whatever days, as many as you need. So you'll see anywhere that there's white background on the field title, that means you can select multiple values from that field. Uh, just a couple of other brief things. You can kind of see uh, the different categories. They alternate color. So you can just tell when you're getting into a new category just helps to organize them a little bit. Uh, and a little bit of a weird thing with um, Google Sheets, you'll see this little warning, a little red arrow pop up. Um, you can ignore that. Some of the scripting that we put in to allow you to select multiple values, uh, the tool, the, the software doesn't love it, but it works fine. You can just ignore that. That's, um, that's not actually an error. All right, so uh, we've got... Uh, just under 20 minutes left, um, which is great. Uh, that'll give us, uh, oh, 10 to 15 minutes to go into breakout rooms and uh, jump in and start interacting with and using some of the uh, some of the tools. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a couple of prompts to uh, get you started. Uh, I'm gonna drop those into the chat now um, so that you all will have them in your chat window when you go into your breakout room. So there are a couple of prompts. So I'll uh, we'll take a look at those uh, before we send you to breakout rooms. Um, the other thing I would suggest is if you haven't uh, pull up the NDIA asset mapping webpage, that has, like I said, a few of the kind of best practices and strategies that I went over. Um, so those are just helpful to reference. So one thing I would suggest is start by just taking a look at the um, the data dictionary, so that second tab, uh, just to kind of see what's there, what are what, the listing of the fields. You can see at the top there's the different descriptions, and then below that's a listing of all the fields. So just kind of you know maybe spend a minute or two just kind of orienting and seeing what all's there in the different categories. Uh, and then we're going to send you to. Um, then you'll actually start thinking about how to put some information in. I encourage you to talk. You'll have uh, several people in each of your breakout rooms, so I encourage you to. Just kind of talk about what resources you might collect. Um, just compare notes as you go. If if you get an idea or want to bounce questions or ideas off one another, uh, definitely do that. So um, I would suggest trying to list one uh, asset from each of the four concentric rings. Again, you can find that on the website. Um, and then think about which fields are important and which ones maybe aren't as necessary for different types of assets as you put them in. And then you can maybe think about um, what types of partner organizations would be really helpful in contributing and, and collecting asset information. And then what's the best way to gather that? Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, we're gonna test out my knowledge of how to automate uh, breakout rooms in, uh, in Zoom. So hopefully this will send us all to the proper breakout room. We can do a little reshuffling if you find yourself sitting in a room all by yourself. So we've got, it looks like people are making their way there. Uh, for folks that aren't assigned, uh, we'll get you sent to a room if you're not seeing something pop up.
Welcome back. I see some people trickling back in. Got about 30 more seconds till everybody joins us. All right, for those of you who are, we've got about 15 seconds, and everybody will be back. Um, for those of you who are trickling back in, uh, we'll have, we have just about five minutes left. So as folks come back in, uh, love to hear how the discussions went, uh, if there were questions, uh, what worked well. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I think we've got everyone back now. We've got uh, about four minutes left. So in the remaining time, I'd love to hear from one or two people uh, about their experience, what worked well, uh, what were some of the assets that you came up with, uh, any questions that came up, any interesting discussion in your group. Um, feel free to raise your hand in the, in the chat and uh, we'll uh, maybe hear from one or two people. Anyone want to share? I see now. Go ahead. Hi. So we we ended up chatting a lot, which was great just to meet other each other. Um, and then we were talking a little bit about, you know, the challenge of finding people outside of our immediate circle. Um, and actually, Caitlin mentioned that the NDIA, we could actually reach out to you to find other affiliates. We've struggled a bit. Um, I'm, I work in the adult education area, and we were trying to find coalitions that are located within the communities that our programs work in, because we we offer a lot of digital literacy instruction, but not necessarily other services. And we wanted to kind of make sure we were plugged into the to the local coalitions. And that's been a real struggle to get response. Like you actually have given us lists, and we've contacted, and there's been no response. And so this remains one of our challenges is how to find yeah. the other folks, the other people out there doing this work. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's an ongoing process. It's and uh, capacity is definitely an issue for, for a lot of folks doing the work. My group talked a bit about the, the money being a way to find people. The fact that there's federal money coming, sometimes you can get folks attention to sit at the table. Yeah. And uh, John, I think you get the last uh, comment. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I came in. I came in here having no clue what this workshop was going to be about. Um, so I may speak for a couple people in this room that may not want to say that. Uh, my administrators shared this with me. Uh, shared this with a couple of administrators to come on, see what this was about. Uh, so I actually we had a great conversation with uh, Paolo. He he was sharing. I kind of just threw the question out there. I was just trying to get a better sense of like. How, how we at Eastern Suffolk well sees, we we have the adult literacy program and that's the program I oversee. I was like trying to get a sense of like, how do I use this? Like, how does it become effective for me? Like, what does that look like? So he was actually super helpful in just kind of giving us some insight as to the lens that we can like look at it through. So we had a really good conversation about, you know, kind of just some, some different ways that we would, you know, we could kind of view this for us. So I wanted to just share that. And That's great. To, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, that's going to be uh, one of our closing notes here as we finish up is uh, we're here as a resource. You hopefully um, got a chance to meet um, some additional NDIA team members in your small group and uh, use us. Um, reach out to us um, as you undertake this work, as you uh, start to explore um, partners and assets in your community. Um, You'll grow that network, uh, even if it takes some time and effort and uh, isn't always easy. Um, you'll grow that network in your community across the state. Um, there's a lot of momentum going on in New York right now. So this is a really good time to be getting into this work in New York. Um, but uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm going to drop my uh, my email in the, the chat. Um, you'll also see our asset mapping page has a link, has an email for Katie, um, who's on this call, who helps maintain that. Um, Paulo uh, manages our coalition work and um, our support for local governments and local organizations. Uh, and everybody on the team is a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, so feel free to reach out to all of us. Um, and as Yvette said, uh, 
please join as an affiliate to NDIA. It's free uh, and opens you up to um, not only our listserv uh, and a lot of resources, um, but uh, a really great community that can support your work, um, that you can commiserate with when things are tough and uh, would love to see you join our community. Uh, and with that, we'll wrap up uh, right at the top of the hour. Uh, the recording will be available. Um, we'll be sharing that out with folks, um, both through NDIA and uh, New York State Library. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, have a great rest of the afternoon, and uh, we hope to be in touch soon.